I can't hear you, Dennis. Issues there are so cleared up. Welcome, welcome. You can hear me now. Welcome yes. to the Library History Channel with the chief discussion call. <laughs> Our FOL public policy analyst call. Welcome to the show. It's always good to be here as a chief discussant. <laughs> right. And, and uh, I, I like to, uh, we, before the show, we played the Lone Star for, for, Forever by uh, a young sister. I think her last name is Go. I tried to reach out to her because I really love her singing. And we also played that, uh, that Ami band. I, I love it. So, Cole, welcome to the show. Tonight, our topic is the last sovereign rulers of the Windwall Coast. Someone saw that and said, what is that? Well, that's why we are here today. Uh, we we're going to be looking at before the uh, independence or the arrival of the uh, ex-slaves, what was referred to as the Windwall Coast. We're going to get all that. And uh, who were some of the rulers, both men and women, so we call them the kings and the queens of the Wing War Coast. Call, welcome to the show, and I've been, uh, yeah, we, we are on course with this. We, we went through, you know, the birth of the Republic, looking at all these, we went yes. through. Now we are at a point, we want to talk about some of those early rulers. Exactly. So, so walk, us, walk us through, because it's, it's like we are on a journey. For those joining us for the first time today, just walk us through that journey and where we are now. So we started off talking about um, Liberia or, or the Grain Coast, the Windward Coast. We talked about Cape Mezzarato mostly. Um, we began the journey in the 1400s and talked about who the sovereign people that were documented to be um, at Cape Mezzarato, what their names were, um, some of the things that they did. We talked about some theories about the King Peters of Cape Mezzarato. There were a, 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 a sequential uh, group of, of rulers that all were called Peter and Peter Peter Pana, um, how he was one of uh, the, the sons of a King of Peter of Cape Mezzarato who had been uh, uh, basically kidnapped and sold into slavery. Um, we went on to talk about the timeline of the slave trade. So we talked about the Windward Coast and Grain Coast before the transatlantic slave trade and then we talked about what occurred during and once the transatlantic trade was abolished and uh the settlement at cape Mezzarato was established and then we went on to talk about how um the recaptured africans and the descendants of enslaved african-american people um along with the uh people that were already at the at cape Mezzarato worked together to establish the republic um, we talked about the concept of sovereign Africans who were living there, who didn't want anything to do with the Republic initially. And uh, we, we've had a long journey with a lot of discussions. I mean, this is, um, and we're really just uh, doing an overview. We haven't really gotten into real depth with each subject um, or topic. We have really just been doing a great um, kind of grand sweeping overview of, of Liberian history to try to create some perspective. Um, the journey that we went through to be where we are today. And so today, part of that journey is to discuss what happened to these sovereign Africans on the Green Coast and why, how were they absorbed? Um, was it done at the point of colonialism or was it done pre-colonialism? These are the discussions we're going to have today. And also it'll tie into how and why the British uh, were able to claim uh, Western Liberia, which is now part of Sierra Leone. I'm, I'm not Thank hearing you, Dennis. I don't Thank know what's you. going on. Oh, no, you are fine. Okay. No, you're fine. Th Thank you, Carl. And mm -hmm. this is a person to what we'll even be looking at. Most of the time, you know, in grade school, I memorized the presidents of Liberia, but I've really not had uh, looked at them closely. So what we're going to be doing in a not too distant future We'll be looking at the presidents of Liberia, from Joseph Jenkins Robert to George Mane Bekupe. Bekupe. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to look at the president closely, and uh, because so, but we're going to go back now and look at these early rulers. They were K 
kings and queens right here from among us. Long yeah. before we have uh, the uh, settlers joining us. Yes. So, what, 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 and and uh, most of us know people like uh, Lango Limpe, we know Swakoko, but this is way before their time. Yes. When do we begin, call? Almost 100 years before their time, 80 to 100 years. So let's, let's start with the slideshow. Let's start with the slideshow. Um, also, uh, I, I, yeah, I prefer having slideshows. It keeps me uh, focused. <laughs> There's a lot of information to present, but we'll start and, with and, this and first. Oh, we, we have a feedback too that our viewers love the slideshow. So yes, I've it. heard that too. So we'll try to, we'll try to do that for everyone um, as much as possible. Okay, so the last sovereign rulers of the Windward Coast. Now, I inserted this map for people to, to kind of see what the Windward Coast is. The Windward Coast is basically what Liberia would have been had they not encroached on the territory. And it was called this long before, you know, the settlers that came as Arado. But when Liberia um, was established and became a country, the Windward Coast stretched all the way to Sherboro Island in the west and all the way to San Pedro in the east. And so that was the coastal territory of the Republic. So if you look at it, Sierra Leone, I mean, this, this, the, the, the boundary between Sierra Leone and Liberia on this Windward Coast map, that is not actually Cape Mount. That's really where Sherbro, banana, I mean, the Plantain Islands and those areas are. So we, we really lost a good portion of our territory to, to, um, hold on, hold on, Carl, because what we hear most of the time is the green coast. You talk yes. about sea water now. So what's the difference? There's really not a whole lot of difference. Um, the Grain Coast, the Windward Coast, the Pepper Coast, it's also called the Rice Coast. Um, you know, in some in some uh, books, depending on which Europeans are writing and in which time period. But it was called the Windward Coast um, uh, during this period of time. And the reason I want to focus on that is because Liberian history, the cultural continuity of Liberia, Sierra Leone, this part of Sierra Leone and Guinea, um, it should not be overlooked. I mean, these people in this area, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea, what we now call the Mono River Union, Ivory Coast has inserted itself there, but the cultural uh, unity of uh, Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone um, is, 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 is evident and prominent throughout history. So when we, we really cannot discuss in any seriousness, um, the history of our people without also mentioning parts of what is now included in Sierra Leone. Um, so that's important to note. So people are gonna say, oh, but why is she talking about this that Sierra Leone? At the time when these things were occurring, it was Liberia. Great. So, so mm -hmm. go ahead. No, I said so. And I see that Sierra Leone, we have the Gold Coast, that's a uh, present day Ghana. We have the yeah. we so, in the wind world. Yeah, so this is obviously before, you know, um, even the Ivory Coast isn't even mentioned here, right? So you've got Gold Coast and you've got Benin. So depending on who's drawing the map and for what purpose, because those places were not really countries, they were just areas, right? So. Um, what they call what they're calling the Gold Coast is is also encompassing part of I, the Ivory Coast, uh, but the Windward Coast. The reason I selected this map is because it clearly points out that coastal territory, uh, much of which we lost, which included a lot of Ivory Coast and Sierra Leone. But we're not going to focus today on the loss of Ivory Coast. We're going to focus on the loss of our territory in Sierra Leone and how that began. So we can go to the next slide. And I, the, the, the next slide has a map that I like to use. I've used it multiple times uh, for different presentations because it clearly uh, points out how far west Liberia went, how far east, and how far north. And I want people to note um, that this old whole west coast was called the Guinea coast. So whenever you see Guinea on these old maps, I don't want you to think of modern day Republic of Guinea just know that we were all considered the Guinea coast all the way you know, through um, what is present day Biafra, Nigeria, Bride of Biafra in Nigeria and the, the um, Delta area, um, the Niger Delta area was all considered the Guinea coast. 
And in fact, to this day, um, in uh, maritime terms, when they talk about the Guinea Current and the Guinea Current Commission, that's the entire sweep of West Africa coming as far as uh, Senegal all the way down. So modern states um, are not to be confused with these older geographical uh, demarcations. Yeah. And then, uh, so that's why I like to show that map because this is essentially um, to show that Liberia, if you look up at the top there, it says Senegambia, right above where it says, you know, Liberia basically went all the way um, to, uh, it went all the way to um, the Sherbro and Plantain Islands. Got it? Yeah. Okay, so the word Guinea again does not re re refer to a country, modern state. Guinea is a geographical term for West Africa. So the Republic of Guinea was named after the geographical term for West Africa. And so all of West Africa was considered Guinea. So that's very important. People sometimes get those things confused. Um, just like ancient Mali is not the same thing as the country of Mali. The borders and boundaries were com were similar but but different and much broader for ancient Mali. Thank you. Same thing with ancient Ghana not being modern Ghana and so on. Yeah. Thank, okay. thank you. And yeah. again, let me welcome our viewers from across the globe. The topic today is the last sovereign rulers of the Windward Coast from Law Yakumba to Masa Masekwe. That's why we are here and we are trying to set the stage here. So here is my friend John Kizo again. <laughs> so I, I'm one of those people, people are gonna get tired of me and my John Kizo business. I mean, this guy, his, his story, his life was fascinating. He was born in Sherbro, uh, which, you know, on the Windward Coast, he was sold into slavery in South Carolina uh, before the American Revolution. He fought on the side of the British in the American Revolutionary War. The British clearly lost because America got its independence. The British then evacuated the African people who fought against um, the American uh, uh, rebels, basically, is what they were, uh, and, and lost. They took them to Nova Scotia. Kizzle and uh, other African um, Americans, some born in the United States. Kizzle was not. He was born on the Windward Coast and spoke uh, the Sherbro language very well. Uh, so he must have been old enough to not forget his native tongue because when he returned, when he was resettled, repatriated in Sierra Leone, he went back to his people and uh, set up a trading post. He spoke English. He had been baptized, converted to Christianity and opened up his own trading post in, in a town. Um, the, the king of Sherbro gave him land and he opened his own town. It was called Kizilton. It was like a, a haven for liberated, uh, recaptured Africans that did not want to live under the thumb of the British. I bring him up because although he's not a traditional king, he was a sovereign. He owned his own land. He controlled his own destiny. And he was the authority for Kizilton, and he was the authority for that area. Um, though he did pay homage and taxes to the King of Sherbro proper, um, he himself in his own right uh, was a ruler or a leader of his of his territory. Yeah. That's... So, so more about John Kizil. Yes. So now, um, so you can, you want to do what we always do where you can Yeah, yeah, yeah let, let me read it. Okay. So, Kezo, in Liberia, we say Kizaz, John Kizaz. <laughs> Kezo ran the trading post on his native Chevrolet Island, a kind of outpost colony of Freetown. It was called Kezoton, of course. He also served as an intermediary between British officials and inhabitants of Chevrolet Island. They included Afro Europeans or Atlantic Creoles, such as the Caucasus and the Clevelands who were descendants of early white British slave traders and several women. Kezo became a prosperous trader and a Baptist preacher who established a church on Chevrolet Island. Hmm. 
So this is this is important. Like I said, he had been baptized. He lived in South Carolina. Uh, one of the things that they like to do when enslaved Africans would, would go to the Americas is the first thing is give them, you know, religion. Uh, so besides being uh, taught to speak English, you must, you know, then, you know, worship God the way that the, the, the uh, common culture worshiped God. So you had to be a Christian. And so Kizzle, uh became not only Christian, became a, a very uh, devout uh, uh, leader in the church and opened his own church um, and became almost like an evan evangelical Christian because he spread Christianity among among the people. Um, that that were at Kizilton in in the surrounding areas. So Thomas Conquer, uh, nine, 1669 to sixteen seventy, ten December. Oh, I'm sorry. Go skip to the next slide. That and then you can go back to that one. That's just out of order. Oh yeah. That's so Kizil. Yeah. So um, he also Kizil also had two hundred and seventy eight lots, in, as they wrote it. And I don't know what if, if this is you know a lot is, is still a quarter of an acre or what that was equivalent to at that time period. We're talking right now about um, 1810 around that, era, that that time period in the city of Freetown. So besides owning Kizilton and controlling that area, he also owned a large portion of prime real estate in the city of Freetown. And that's important because this is an African man born in Africa, had been through an incredible adventure in his life, fought against the rebels uh, on the side of the British in the Revolutionary War. Um, and Kizil went on you know, to, to acquire all of this property, um, but he was forced to forfeit his property because he allegedly owed a large, and I say the word ambiguous, um, debt to the British government and to the Sierra Leone company. If you remember from previous shows, yeah. we talked about the Sierra Leone company being the equivalent of the American colonization society for the British. Oh, in fact, it was a Sierra Leone company that ACS modeled itself after. How Kizil could have ended up owing them money is beyond my wildest imagination. There's no documentation I'm able to find to even support that he owed them money I want to believe that he did not have a debt to them. And this is just a way for them to kind of, uh, you know, bully him, strong arm him out of his property. And as you'll see, this happened. This is the era where pre-colonial area where the British are wanting to control trade. And they even tried it with Liberia a few years later. And so um, Liberia proper, meaning the, the, the seat of government in Monrovia. Uh, so Kizilton, all of these areas, not Freetown, but Kizilton fell in the, the, the jurisdiction of the Liberian colony later. But we're going to you know, talk about what happened. Freetown was controlled by the British. Everything east of that was sovereign territory. It was not controlled by the British. And so when Liberia became um, a, a nation, those areas fell under Liberian jurisdiction. So you're going to notice what happens around uh, 1825. If you can go back to the previous slide that I asked you to skip, I apologize for doing those out of order. The one that was talking about Thomas uh, Coker, yes, yeah. and you can you can go on from there. Yeah, Thomas Coker, uh, 1669 to 1670, September 10, 1700, Far Mouth Cornwall was known as an English agent for the Royal African Company on York Island on the Windward Coast, now Chevro Sierra Leone. He married a Chevro princess and had two sons with her before his early death. Yes, so Thomas Cor Corker was either 30 or 31 when he died. And so he was either 30 or 31 when he when he passed away um, on, the, on the 10th of September, 1700. We don't know his date of birth. The interesting thing about Thomas Corker is that he went native. Um, if you don't know what that means, there's a term, uh, you know, in, in, in some of these early European exploration books where um, Europeans or Americans, Western people or, or uh, you know, people of European descent will go to 
you know, West Africa or go to some place and, you know, and, and they become native. They, they, they start to live like the people, they speak the language of the people and they adopt their customs and they don't want to return to um, their previous life. This was the case of Thomas Corker. He became Sherbro. He married this princess, he settled there. This is who he was. He had his children with her. He didn't, you know, he didn't any longer um, conduct himself like an Englishman. He became, you know, he, as they say, he went native. Um, you, you know, do you want me to further elaborate on that? For a second? Yeah, because there's a different corporal, right? He's not part of the uh, of the ACS. This is this man died in 1700. Okay. So we're talking about 119 years before before the first ship left, before the Elizabeth left. I'm sorry, 120 years. He died 120 years before the Elizabeth. So he died in, on the 10th of September, 1700. Yeah, oh, yes. And, and it's, it's, it's really interesting how, you know, these are Europeans, the British, they were living in this place long before even what we know today as uh, the arrival of the settlers. And even though we cover this at length in other shows, like really, what was attracting these people to this place? Yeah, so trade, wealth, you know, they had besides the the ominous, you know, trade in human beings, they also had rice, they had gold, they had ivory, they had lumber, timber, they had so many things to trade. And so this is an economic hub along this, this, this Woodward Coast, Grain Coast, you know, um, Rice Coast. So this is where you have your, your prime uh, agricultural slaves, you know, human beings that were being enslaved for agricultural purposes because they were already engaged in agriculture and had techniques for farming rice that were foreign and more advanced than anywhere else in the world. So we introduced modern techniques of rice cultivation to the world, the people of the Windward or, or, or Rice Coast, as it was also called. Um, so you've got, you know, Coker in, in the late 1600s, British merchant, definitely trading in human beings, definitely trading in some other things. But at this period in time, 1700, the primary um, emphasis for people to go to this place was definitely human human chattel um, slavery so you know i skipped around timeline a little bit i'm definitely not going chronologically i wanted to start with 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 uh Kessel, um and and go back to the ancestors of the corkers of sierra leone so that we could understand that these um next kings we're going to talk about are descendants of uh, Thomas Corker, who's British, and this is why they have these English names. We also talked about something um, about the, the Peters of Maserato possibly being, um, because it is not African culture really to trace a patril or West African culture to trace a patrilineal lineage um, with the same name through generations. That's very, very British. It's very, very European. So whenever you see generations of King Peters on uh, Case Maserato, there's a huge possibility that they're descendants of of it of, of the European. And, 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 and Captain Peter is who I suspect was the ancestor of the King Peters of Maserato. But we must do more research to confirm this. But right now, that's what the evidence is pointing to, because even though they look like everyone else, just like the Parkers of, of, of what is now considered Sierra Leone, but at the time was, you know, later on became was Liberia, the Corkers don't look any different from any other Sierra Leoneans because it doesn't take much to erase European features. They then become recessive. So you have a, a, a Englishman and a Sherbrooke princess get married, have the three sons and other children. They never name how many daughters they have. These three sons go on to form a dynasty. Well, they're marrying Sherbro women. So they're lighter skinned, they marry Sherbro women. That's it. That next generation looks like everybody else. So you're talking about 1700 and today, their descendants are still in Sierra Leone. They're still very prominent citizens who Thank inherited you. a lot of wealth. Thank you. Carl, your, your uh, audio is getting a little- Okay. 
So let's take a break and then you can get out and come back in. Okay, sounds good. All right. Welcome back. This is Focus on Liberia, the Liberia History Channel, with me, the Chief Discussion Carl Famula, who is a historian and also FOL Public Policy Analyst. Carl, we're talking about Thomas Coca. This is in um, 1700. Yes, he died. He died in September um, of 1700 and left three sons um, who continued uh, his business. He was a slave dealer. He lived went native, he became a prominent uh, uh, slave dealer, which was the, uh, the business at the time. And uh, this is the kind of legacy he left with these three boys who then needed to spread themselves out and, and their, their subsequent children. So we're going to go to the next slide. Not the Kizzle slide, you, of course you might, we, we went out of order a little bit. Oh God, I skipped a lot of stuff with Kizzle. You can skip that one. The show isn't really about Kizzle. Okay. So basically the sons became merchant traders um, and developed a family yeah. dynasty uh, that sorry. became... Huh? Tucker's son. Yes. Okay. So they developed a, fam a family dynasty. So this was 1700 he died. His sons were very young when he died. Um, but they grew up and they, they continued the business. And... The, 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 the tragedy in this is that they always, even though they were Sherbro, but because of this one ancestor, who was probably some reject, you know, from Liverpool. I don't think he was anyone too prominent. Um, he was very young working on the ship. So it's very likely that um, he was like a ship hand or something and just basically abandoned and said, hey, you know, I can, I can work here and be extremely prominent among these people. And uh, that's what he did. Uh, so um, you can go on to the next slide. Yeah. So after the transatlantic slave trade was abolished, the demand increased on the Windward Coast. Don Pedro and his satellites had struck a vein richer than the Gold Coast, his flush Barracons became proverbial throughout the Spanish and Portuguese colonies, as well as the U.S. Sea Coast Island. His lookouts were ceaseless in their signal of approaching vessels. New factories were established as branches north and south of the parent den. Manor, Rock, Chevro, Sugari, Cape Mount, Little Cape Mount, and even Digby, or Bombing at the door of Monrovia, all had depots and barracoons of slaves belonging to white traders. Yes. So the entire windward coast um, around the time that Liberia was established was now dotted you know, with these trading posts and had Europeans permanently settled at these places. And the reason these Europeans had the ability to be settled is because the rulers of Cape Maserato had given them these, uh, this power. 
So I'm giving this backstory before we start talking about the, the leaders, because we need to understand what was happening, how they were able to work with people, uh, partner with people who then turned around and basically um, took their, you know, attempted to take the territory. Um, this was not successful um, at Cape Mount. And that's important to note as well. But yes, these all of these places uh, um, had permanent Europeans living there permanently. And I think for a lot of people, this is pretty mind blowing. And this is before um, Liberia has even been established. Does anyone have any questions about this? Should we just keep yeah, rolling? Let, 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 let's, let's go to that. Yeah, so, I, think, I think this is pretty, you know, because most of the time people don't think about, you know, think about this. So, so who was this Don Pedro guy? Don Pedro was the last uh, um, mega slave dealer, um, you know, in that part of in that part of the world. He had the slave trading post at Galenus. I hear a lot of librarians say, oh, you know, we don't have any slave castle, uh, so we didn't have slavery. Well, yes, we did. Because Galenus was within the Liberian territory at the time. Mm -hmm. It is in Sierra Leone today, but at that time it was within the Liberian territory. And around Galenus, what you have there are Bai and Mendi people. So, Galena's territory um, at the at the Mono River. Remember, Liberia went beyond Galena's all the way to Sherbrooke, but Galena's is right at the mouth of that Mono River that that today divides Liberia and Sierra Leone. There was a huge slave, you know, factory there. There were, you know, there's still ruins of it that people, you know, in Sierra Leone can go on tour and visit you know, the dungeons and the shackles and things, the ruins. Um, it was destroyed by the British and the Liberian forces later. They, you know, cannon bombed it, but there's still ruins and there's still remnants of it for people to go and visit. Um, the kings that were present at that point, um, I don't want us to pass judgment on history and, and start looking at history backwards and start thinking of these people as horrible people because that was what was normal in that period of time. Slave trading was in their minds at that time, a legitimate business. This is important to note. I don't know if they understood that that process of engaging in the slave trade would dehumanize their descendants and that it would no longer matter if you were a king or if you were a slave and it became a badge, your black skin became a badge of slavery, no matter who your ancestors were. I don't think they were clearly, they were not aware of that or they would not have um, conducted themselves the way they did. Uh, so I needed to point that out before we start talking about um, these specific rulers. Um, I want to talk about um, one of my favorite uh, queens, in, 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 in Liberian history, Liberian Sierra Leonean history, uh, which is Queen Yakumba. You can go, yeah. So Yakumba um, and the cessation of Cerebro. Now I've read so much on Yakumba and as oral tradition says that she didn't, she was an abolitionist. She didn't believe in slavery. Oh, hold, Very, a hold on a minute, Carl, because mm -hmm. uh, today Liberia, Ya, mm -hmm. Mano, uh, Ma, and Kumba, is Kisi. So you see, uh, <laughs> Yakumba kind of, if you, if, if you call that name in Labro today, people would be like, what? Can yeah. Yakumba? So she definitely had Kisi heritage, which is considered, she was considered Sherbro. So I have a running theme. I always tell people in West Africa, ethnicity is fluid. Ethnicity is fluid. What does that mean? It means people, especially among the poor groups, the poor ethnic groups, Intermarriage, interconnection is very prominent. All along that uh, 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 Galenas River or, or Mono River, you've got Kisi people, you have all of those related to Kisi. You've got Mono, you've got Mendi, you've got Bandi, you have everybody interacting, intermarrying, warriors being warriors together. 
So Poro was more like a federation that connected these people in some ways. Right. So you do have this intermarriage, even as recently as, as Suakoko. You know, Suakoko, she's Pella, she's Mono, where she's getting these names. Um, you know, so this is not this is not strange. It's not unique to um, to her situation. Many of us, you know, you have to understand that if 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 a Kisi woman marries a Sherbro, they have children in a Sherbro community. Those children will speak Sherbro. But she was a princess. Her father was the king of Sherbro, and she was essentially the last legitimate queen. Um, but she was benevolent. She was benevolent um, from the oral tradition. She didn't believe in chattel slavery and human bondage. So you could seek refuge within Yakumba and you would be safe um, from being you know, sold into slavery is the, how the story goes. Now, a while back, I did a, a video that's on YouTube and I did send that to you. You can play that. I think that will kind of put things into perspective about who Yakumba was. Um, before you played, I do want to say that um, she was uh, deposed by the British eventually, and they say her people were sold into slavery, um, many of them. So we can go ahead and watch. <laughs> In the Mende, Gola, and Kisi languages, Ya means the highest, most exalted, and is added as a prefix or suffix to a name to denote status of a ruler or lord of the land. Kumba is the Gisi name for second daughter. Much of what we know of Queen Ya Kumba has been passed down through oral traditions and effigies that have been created in her honor found today among the Gisi people of Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone. Queen Yakumba was the daughter of a captured Gisi princess from the north and a Sherbro king. She ruled her territory with benevolence, abolishing slavery within its boundaries. Many victims of slave raids and other atrocities sought refuge within her kingdom. Queen Yakumba reigned from 1790 until her kingdom succumbed to war and sabotage in the year 1825. The 1825 British record states, whereas the Kusu tribes have commenced hostilities against overrun and depopulated part of the territories belonging to Yakumba, Queen of Yakumba, her allies, tributary kings, chiefs, and headmen, and have manifested so determined a spirit as to leave no room to doubt that their ultimate object is to overrun the said territories, to exterminate the present possessors of the soil by the sword or by selling them into slavery. The record further states, and so satisfied thereof is Yakumba, her tributary kings, chiefs, and headmen, that she has of her own free will and accord stepped forward and thrown herself and her country upon the protection of the British government as the surest means of saving herself and her subjects from the destruction threatened by their cruel and implacable enemies. While it may be true that the Kuso, also known as the Mende, invaded and captured portions of the territory within the dominion of Queen Yakumba, enslaving its inhabitants and wreaking all kinds of terror upon those in the vicinity. What we do know for a fact is that Queen Yakumba was never present, nor did she in person surrender her territory and dominion to the British in exchange for protection. She was instead represented by notorious slave dealers Thomas and George Cocker, who the British claimed to have been her lawful representatives and next of kin. 
The truth is, Thomas and George Corker, who signed for Queen Yakumba, were actually the descendants of a British slave merchant who had children with a Sherbro princess. When he returned to England, his sons continued the savage family business of trading in human beings. As if that were not enough, the Calkers and their allies went on to aid and abet the British in a massive land grab and the ultimate subjugation of the inhabitants of the area. While the history books say that the British abolished the transatlantic slave trade in 1807, it is a fact that hundreds of thousands of people were still uprooted, kidnapped, and enslaved and sent across the Atlantic. And this, no doubt, was the fate of many of the inhabitants of the kingdom of Yacumba. Spanish slavers took them to places like Cuba, Spanish Florida, the sea coast of Georgia and South Carolina. If you let them tell the story, Robert Winslow Gordon is credited with writing the song Come By Here. After visiting the seacoast islands and hearing the Gullah Geechee people singing Kumbaya, his assumption was it was a mispronunciation of Come By Here. And that is the official title and explanation for the origin of the song. Amen. <laughs> yeah, so that that is um that is my my theory of, of where that song came from. And I'm pretty I mean the evidence is overwhelming. <laughs> it's overwhelming. First of all, uh there's British literature where they refer to, in old English, ruler is called Lord, not God. But you know, Lord doesn't necessarily mean God. It used to just mean king or or head or, or you know important person. Even to this day, they'll say, "Oh, Lord, Lord Jackson of you know whatever, Lord Pepperpot." You know, the British use the word Lord, the House of Lords. So anybody who was prominent was a ruler was called Lord. So they would refer to Lord Cockner, Lord Kumba, Lord this, and this. The idea, you know, in our culture, if you say. Um, I have a cousin whose name we call her Nambu Ye. Ye Nambu, Nambu Ye. It's the same thing. You can say it in reverse. You can say it backwards or forwards. It's the same name. Um, so, Ya Kumba, Kumba Ya, same thing, in my, you know, my, my opinion. Um, the, the phrase come by here just absolutely doesn't make any sense um, in lieu of, every, of all the other evidence. But um, the reason I wanted to point out Ya Kumba is because when they destroyed a lot of these people, their descendants, their immediate family members often, and also their their protectors, you know, those who served them, those who, you know, those warriors that protected them, the people who worked on their rice plantations were often transplanted to places like Jekyll Islands in Georgia or um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Hilton Head Island. This is, these are places they took these people before they became tourists. Uh, attractions and they 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 grew the rice. They grew the rice, um, um, you know, for the United States. Uh, so that's important to note, and that's exactly where that Kumbaya song comes from. It's the same Gullah Geechee people, and Gullah Geechee Gola Kisi. And, and so basically, this is a this is a song. They are prison. 
law come back. Yes, you know we do that. That's how we uh, we we uh, windward coast, rain coast people. We sing praises to our our leaders. Right. In fact, you know, uh, <laughs> they sing praises to me, and then you know, like uh, even if you have a name, I, I still remember if my um, we were on the farm, and they start to my father start to call me because we we go by the uh, your ancestors. So. The, my name, you know, there is a genealogy that goes with it, and people sing. So it's really very, it's not uncommon to uh, sing in people's name, even yeah. regular people. And if you listen to the words of the song, it tells a tragic story. So this is another clear indication. You know, someone's crying, my Lord, kumbaya. You know, they're talking about something tragic that happens. Mm. You know, it, 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 this is a tragedy. And so a lot of times we're a people of oral tradition. We pass our history and our stories on through songs. And I just, you know, when you listen to what's left of the song, you know, after it's become modernized and, you know, mm -hmm. you can still see that this is a transfer of this history through this oral song. It's like um, oral, for longness. And oh, yeah, and so it's been lost because, for obvious reasons, they like to erase these things. They don't want to tell these people you descended, you're descended from this queen, and your great grandparents, your great great grandparents, were singing the song for this reason. You know, they want to. You're not baptized. You're Christian. You're singing to God. You're singing to Jesus. You're no longer singing to Yakumba. You're saying, "Come by here." I mean, why can Kumbaya be come by here? It makes no sense. <laughs> it makes no sense. And, and uh, Kumaya, I mean, she was disposed. And the yes. Story is that. Yeah, tell me a little bit about that. So the, the video, I mean, you know, that was done a few years ago by my friends at Save the State, but the, the um, for, for me for this purpose, but the, pra pra the practice at that time was to get these guys to sign treaties. Mm -hmm. Now, I want you to know this is 1825 that the Calkers, the reason I had even brought them up at all was to talk about how Yakumba became the last true queen of Sherbro. Because after her, there were others, but they were illegitimate. Um, but she became the last true sovereign queen of Sherbro because um, the Calkers, who were her relatives, remember, uh, their ancestor married the Sherbro princess and had a child. So all of these dynasties, whether it be the Banana Islands, whether it be Sherbro Island, all of these dynasties and what is now what used to be Western Liberia in 1825, all of these places, um, the, 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 the rulers were related to each other. And so Kumba Yakumba refused to cede her territory to the British. And so her cousins did it for her. Yeah, signed for her. <laughs> hmm? I see her cousin signed for her. Yeah, they signed, they did it for her because she refused. And interestingly enough, while they're signing for her, the Mendi warriors rise up against her and depose her and sell them into slavery. So we have a history of them weaponizing Africans against Africans when they don't do what they want them to do. So here's an example, yet another example of a sovereign African refusing to concede territory to the British and other Africans doing it for her. Not only signing a treaty, but also waging war against her, being incited against her and her kingdom. And and for those of us who lived through the Labrin Civil War, we, we can relate. It's like, uh, and that's why every time I, I look at, you know, wars and the slave trade, I, I try to compare to the Labrin Civil War, where, you know, people fight yeah. each other thinking that they are at war, but it's someone actually doing the programming. Yeah, someone's there, you know, there'll be a rift, or there'll be incentive for someone, you know, there's envy, all kinds of things, and they will see that rift and exploit it, exacerbate it, blow it up. You know, oh, you know, your people are being oppressed or whatever the case, and they will exacerbate it. 
you know, light that flame, they'll, they'll put gas on it and, and, and turn it into something else. So this is this is a a, um, a situation, unfortunately, that has repeated itself throughout history in different circumstances. But again, in 1825, this was technically Liberian territory. And it is these treaties that were signed under duress or trickery um, in this particular case that the British used to take Liberia all the way up to the Mono River or the Galenas River. It has many names, but look, we, today I think we call it the Mono River or Makino River today. So they basically fought um, Liberia and they were using these 1825 forward treaties. Why did they need to sign these treaties after Liberia was established? Mm -hmm. Because they wanted to control trade. And here is this group of Americanized, Westernized Negroes controlling trade, being a potential threat, negotiating with sovereign Africans. So the British want to come in and lay claim to territory to their trade posts so that they can actually own it as opposed to having just rights to it. So yeah. that these, you know, because you've got these, these different people working in these different ways. Now we come to, to, to um, Cape Mount was also sold, <laughs> which is why they tried to take Cape Mount many years later from King Masa for the last, the last king of Cape Mount. So King Fanta, uh, I'm sorry, Fana Toro was a documented uh, king of the area that, of, of, of Waconco, that area. His son, Prince Gray, becomes King Gray. Um, Gray, I'm not sure I would, if anyone listening speaks by, but this name precedes Liberia. Whether it's due to British influence or is it mean, does it mean something in that? That's what I don't know. But, you know, his son was Gray, and we've got many people named Gray uh, in Liberia today from the, from the, by, um, the from the by uh, descendants uh, named Gray. Uh, so this is a very old name. I know a lot of times people think it's some, you know, a miracle Liberian name. It is not. Uh, Gray is a very old name at Cape Mount uh, before Liberia was settled by Americans. Uh, but Fanta Toro uh, and Prince Gray basically uh, sold or supposedly signed a treaty um, to sell Cape Mount. Uh, first to Pedro Blanco, and then second, Pedro Blanco, remember, is the guy who the, the Spaniard who had the slave, the massive slave uh, network at Galinas. And then later on, uh, 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 Prince Gray also sold a portion of Cape Mount to the British, supposedly to have this treaty. So this again gave them cause to come in and take Cape Mount all the way through to Bomi away from Liberia, but they failed, uh, thanks to uh, the late great Mama Lumasa play, who was able to retain that property and not, and, and uh, uh, he did, however, lose um, the land on the other side of the river that he tried to fight for. And uh, again, the British, what they used in court was the cessation um, treaty that they signed with Yakumba and others. And Gray today, we have a representative, Carlos Gray, probably a descendant. Could be. Safwa made Gray, all these Grays, yeah. Yeah. By the middle of the century, the development of the liberated African community in Sierra Leone under the tutelage of British administration, churches, and education meant that some of its members were provided a considerable reinforcement for the British interest in West Africa. Economic activities in Sierra Leone itself were limited, and the British were soon finding their way along the coast towards Shebro, the western edge of the Liberian territory. Yeah. And that's a British flag. Yeah. So they the, the this I so before the American flag was flown on Liberian territory, the British flag was flown. Um in what we now call Liberia. I mean, there's documented um, history, established history 
of Boatswain uh, going up to Bopuru with the British flag and planting it in Bopuru uh, when he went to go um, set up his, his, his trade in human beings up in Bopuru. So when he went up the St. Paul River from the coast with a bunch of warriors to conquer that area, um, that area had a lot of people who, who spoke Pella um, and they conquered that place. He implanted the British flag and they held those people under siege and that became their post to raid villages um, in the vicinity in order to get human beings to supply the slave trade. Wow. So this was another cause for the British, again, to try to lay claim to that part of Liberia that uh, borders Sierra Leone, that part of Bopu uh, that borders Sierra Leone. Their claim was, hey, we had our agent, Boatswain, had gone there and planted this flag. And this is another reason when we talk about Liberian history and people try to say that Boatswain and Sal Bozo are the same person. It makes no sense. The, when they talk about Boatswain, they, the British are very clear about who he was and what he was doing for them. And the story, the oral tradition about Sal Boso says he comes from the north. <laughs> the documented history about Boatswain is describing a completely different human being who isn't really a king at all. He's just, he's just basically a um, very powerful military guy whose who's, who's, uh, power comes from Basically, there's this connection with the British, his access to artillery and, 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 and troops and soldiers. So he's more of a military uh, force used to, uh, um, to basically to raid for slaves. Where when they talk about Sal Boso, he seems to be more of a king that was uh, indigenous to the area. The other thing is Boatswain. Um, was from Shabar, and that's well documented as well. Shabar is, is, is uh, again, a part of Liberia that has been um, uh, given or taken by the British. It's now Sierra Leone. Not to digress, but could Boswain and Sal Boso both be Mandingo? Boswain was Balam um, from, from what is now Sierra Leone. Um, we had a number of Madingo and even Fulani um, powerful people within the Liberian territory. Um, we had an invasion of Fulani people before Liberia was established. They came down from the, the highlands of Futajalan, conquered parts of Cape Mount, conquered um, their way down, and uh, before Liberia was even established. So you had, uh, you know, uh, Fulani. Uh, influence and, and Madingo influence before Liberia was established, um, long before Liberia was established. So, but Boatswain was not was not um, was of so that of that royal lineage. No, mm -hmm. the Boatswain that they write about is was someone who worked on a merchant ship, had gone to Liverpool, worked on these slave ships as a Boatswain, and so he just took the name and called himself Boatswain. Nobody named him that. That's what he called himself. It was pretty common in those days. Um, a lot of the crewmen on the coast. So the people um, in Shabar, the Balam people, were similar to the crewmen in, in, in Liberia in that they worked on, on ships. They, they worked with these merchant ships a lot. And they took on and named themselves, called themselves some pretty ridiculous. In our you know 21st century mindset, they, they called themselves some pretty ridiculous things like Boatswain, Short Trazas. I mean, I read about a crewman who became very wealthy uh, working on these European ships. He called himself short trousers. I mean, just funny, funny stuff like that. Um, but that does not seem like royalty to me. No dignified African sovereign would be calling himself boatswain and would have been working as a, as a boatswain on a merchant ship. The sovereign African royalty um, were very, very dignified. And whenever they did send their children to Liverpool, it was for education, um, not for uh, media, media, you know, work, you know, like on the sh as a ship hand, no. Hmm. So this just demonstrates, um, this photo just basically just demonstrates um, how the process of education, the British expansion uh, into that area, um, the, the, the mission schools, uh, headed by uh, westernized Africans who uh, were descendants of um, 
both indigenous um, Atlantic and also Atlantic Africans and African Americans who settled in Sierra Leone. So, I mean, and then, so this, this, this slide just basically demonstrates, um, it was actually sketched um, around 1820, um, depicts, uh, supposed to, supposedly depicts uh, two royal uh, uh, men, uh, slave traders on the Grain Coast. They look to me to be uh, Muslim uh, because of the attire. I cannot say for sure because it's not said on the uh, slide, but that's how the attire looks. Um, one of the things that I, I noticed is that they used the term Madingo to describe Madingo people, Fulani people, all Muslim people a lot of times. And so it's very difficult to decipher what the ethnicity is. I don't know if it's necessarily important to do that, but it's difficult. Um, there's some descriptions they talk about, they call the people Madingo, but when they describe them, they're clearly describing Fulani people. So they'll say, oh, the Madingo people, they are light, fairer skinned, they have curl, uh, straighter hair, straight noses. I'm like, okay. And they come from the highlands of Guinea. No, the highlands of Guinea, that's Futa Jalan, those are Fulani people. But the Europeans didn't care enough to distinguish us ethnic, um, ethnically unless it suited their purpose to divide. But otherwise, they would just call us blanket terms, just like the term crew. It just came to call everybody on the coast, all the coastal fishermen crew. They didn't care if you were uh, um, Basa, what we call Basa today. They didn't care if you were um, Gribble. They didn't care if you were a uh, clow. Everybody was just crew. And it was a similar thing. So um, that gets confused a lot. I hear Madingo people saying, oh, I used to look like, no, no, your people, Madingo people are, 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 are not Asiatic Africans. They are Black Africans. They're Mendi speaking people. And they're from the Mendi ethnic groups, um, very closely related to other Mendi ethnic groups. The Fulani people are from the north. They have Asiatic ancestry and African ancestry. And that's why they look a bit different. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you're just joining us, this is Focus on Liberia. We are discussing the last sovereign rulers of the Windwall Coast, from Queen Yakuma to Mansa Massacre. Carl, let's talk a little bit about Mansa Massacre. Okay, so I was going to get into that, but it's going to take, and maybe there's going to be a leeway into our next episode. And the reason I, I wanted to stop here is because um, I realized that Mansa Masakwe needs his own show. <laughs> right. So let's take a short break when we come yeah. back. We can take some questions and stuff, but yeah, yeah definitely I can say a little bit about him, but I want everybody to watch the next show. We're going to emphasize yeah. on that struggle, Mansa Masakwe, his ancestors, yeah. and how that came to be. Yeah, let's let's take that separately. That you you are correct. Six zero five three one three six zero zero four. The code is seven nine one four zero three. Join the conversation. We have rulers before the rulers we have today, and I won't get into the politics of it to compare the rulers there and the rulers now, or the leaders there and the leaders now. That's a separate show. But think about that. Think about that, and and do the comparison in your head. But uh, get prepared to call the number. We're going to be reading comments also. But before we do that, we're going to take a short break and be right back. At Focus on Liberia, we discuss everything Liberia. From education to politics, arts and culture, entertainment, agriculture, history, religion, family, and technology. Focus on Liberia uncovers and showcases the best of Liberia and shows the world the truth about Liberia. We educate, elevate, and promote all things Liberia. We conduct interviews, panel discussions, debates, and more. Tune in to Focus on Liberia on Facebook and YouTube and be a part of the stories that make up the news. This is Focus on Liberia, and I am Dennis Jack. Welcome back to Focus on Libra. This is the Libra History Channel with the chief discussing Carl Famula. If you want to join the History Channel, please uh, give us a call. You can call me, you can call call, or just drop us a line, focus on Libra at gmail.com. And uh, sometimes we want someone to give us oral history. You know, tell me what you what you know in your village or uh, there is a, I'm working on a, a show for someone to tell us some oral history about the Kua people or the Bele. You know, what is it that you know? Let's talk about ourselves. Sometimes uh, 
I, I don't want you to look at this and it be so academic for you. <laughs> you have something to present about your own village, what you do there. Come on here yeah. and let's discuss Liberia at Focus on Liberia. We educate, we elevate, and promote all things Liberia. By far, this is the best show on the planet. <laughs> Absolutely. Let me read a few comments here. We have some uh, callers on the line. Jimmy was okay. enjoying the uh, rendition of the Lone Star Forever by the young lady. Yeah, she's awesome. Dr. Edison Pajewo joining us from Ghana. Hey, Paje. <laughs> Listening quietly, call and Dennis, my scholar in resident, is at it again. The learning Mrs. Call formula, yes. For anyone who knows the value and beauty of mankind, there is nothing more exciting and worthwhile than the study of history. And to add, the way called dissects it. <laughs> Thank you. That's Thank you for all the info. Jimmy is watching us on YouTube. Swa Mapu, I'm once again in awe of this young lady. Thanks, God. I don't ever want to miss your knowledge being <laughs> Jimmy is telling us it says call say he and I are we here. Thank you, Dennis. We appreciate. We want to thank all of you for watching. Dave said, What was Kezo trading in? Is there evidence that he engaged in slave trade? I'll wait to do it. Yeah. Uh Professor Laru Dewey, 15 slaves were sold from the area that became Liberia. Anna Otago, I'm late, but I'm glad to be here. Professor Laru Dewey sometimes take her off track, but here he said, according to the research of Dr. Carl Patrick Borrow, some 155,000 slaves were sold from the area that became Liberia. Yeah, yeah from, the, from the windward coast that's correct probably more than probably far more than that yeah uh dr padua respond keso was not selling slave he was a partner of paul coffee in an organization called friendly society in freetown that's true according to research of historian marie Tyler mcgraw the settlers were not involved in the slave trade in the area became <laughs> liberia Dr. Stella Jefferson, my favorite show. Our people were heroes. She continues, oh my goodness, well done. I could place myself into the story. That's the story of Ya Kumba. Mm -hmm. uh, Sam Sagan, after that, uh, that little video said, that's a nice piece, Carl. And Dr. Barton Kulo said, wow, Carl, this is amazing history. Jimmy, these imagine those slavers never tried to understand anything about us. It was easy for them. Everything about all was an error. That song speaks to the soul. That's Kumbaya. Dr. Paddy said, tonight's show is being watched by just nine persons. Yeah, it was like <laughs> many people need the practical knowledge. Prof Carl needs to make the ultimate sacrifice of joining the University of Liberia to start the African Studies Department. Hmm. And Dr. Pajibo, you know the story. I think you you try to do something like that, but let me leave you at that. <laughs> I can only imagine. <laughs> uh, no, first, Aliu Samba says she is right. There were two different people, many King, Sao Boso, and Boswan. Aliu continue, she's also correct. Mandingo people are originally Black. They are not mixed with Arabs or any group from Asia. Stella Jeffrey, this is the reason why I support Vladimir Putin. Oh my God. Those <laughs> 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 uh, Western always wanted to keep taking, but they would not take Ukraine like they took all of Africa. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, That's so funny. Bobby E. Wright, greeting Dr. Formula and Dennis. Dr. Formula, I'm not a doctor. <laughs> I've, I've been called doctor or professor many times. So <laughs> let, let's take off. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, call, go ahead and respond to uh, the Kingsley story, and then we can take our first caller. So there's scholarly debate. Um, the scholarly, scholarly, uh, scholarly debate about Kizilton, uh, his, you know, being also an outpost for the slave trade. Um, there are accounts of, you know, uh, supposedly people being sold, uh, but most of the evidence points 
towards supporting the idea that he was actually an abolitionist and was in favor of, of settling uh, free, free black freemen. Um, there were absolutely slaves being sold west of Freetown. Kiselton's west of Freetown, how far west? Galena's wasn't far away from Kiselton. Um, so I, I want to believe that um, the accusations um, of him selling slaves, uh, uh, you know, were um, rooted in other um, motives. I don't, I don't necessarily, I don't believe he did. Um, he was uh, definitely an abolitionist. He was an Africanist also. Um, so I don't believe that he sold slaves. Uh, what was the other question? Oh, okay. Let's go to this one. Can you briefly mm -hmm. read on King Sao Boso background? We can, we can do that. And then there will come a time we talk about this, uh, later. Yeah. So I'll just answer that very quickly. Uh, King Sao Boso, Boso, and you know, all these things we, we, we hear about King Sao Boso in the oral tradition. The oral tradition, they start writing about his existence in the 1940s, 50s, 60s. You start seeing it being documented. Not before that, I have not seen any older documentation of the name Sao Bozo. So then they say, oh, they named Sao Bozo Botswain. No, they didn't. We had a lot of African kings with African names whose names were not changed. Boatswain, there's so much documentation on Boatswain that he can't be Sal Boso. And also, I believe that Sal Boso lived later in time because even in the oral tradition, you have people who were alive in the 1960s who knew Sal Boso. If you knew Sal Boso in the, and you were still living in the 1960s and he was, if, if he were the same person as Boatswain, Boatswain died before 1830. It is not possible that someone living in the 1960s knew Boatswain. Sal Boso existed much later, probably in the early 1900s, not the early 1800s. So the timeline just doesn't, and also Benjamin J.K. Anderson in 1868, when he went to Bopuru, he never mentions Sal Boso. He talks about King Mamalu. He talks about all of these other Madingo kings that he meets. He never talks about the Sal Boso. He never mentions Sal Boso that anyone referred to Boatswain as Sal Boso. He talks about Boatswain. He talks about Boatswain's grave that he visited. Never mentions that his that Boatswain descendants called him Sal Boso, which clearly means there was no Sal Bozo before Benjamin Anderson went to Bopu because he was so meticulous in documenting names of people, their parentage, their ancestors, and things like that. So it is very likely that the person that we all know as Sal Bozo lived after Anderson made his journey to Bopu. So Boatswain was a foreigner. He was not a king. He was not a Madingo king. He was from Shabar. That is documented. Um, we had Madingo kings at Cape Maserato along the St. Paul River um, in the Northern Territories and places where you're now Lofa, many documented by Benjamin Anderson. None of them was named um, Sao Boso. Great. And Carl, I think you and I first saw this on your Save the State uh, channel about the 1962 census that they met a woman who say i know that guy right remember that story that oh yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 so yeah. she you know they're saying that she's i uh, she would have been a hundred and some more years old she did probably know sal bozo but she probably right. knew sal bozo in the 1920s or 30s not right. the 1820s so this woman i mean it's just a logical explanation and this became a big you know, and, and you know, Archie posts this and everybody under the post is like, wow, this is incredible. This woman was so very old. Human beings do not live that long. Mm. So you this know, is, this is a 1962 census, right? That was conducted. And this woman, Madame Zo Keta uh, of Bopolu, talking about, you know, seeing Sao Boso. So people say, well, if this lady, 1962, sees Sao Boso, 
that it means Sal Bozo is different from Kim Boswain. So yes. Kind of, yeah. and, and also Benjamin Anderson, where he says that Boswain's grave was, is not where Sal Bozo's grave is today. Yeah. That's also important because he talks about the coordinates of where he plays. He talks about Sal Bozo's grave being marked by a, uh, a granite stone, a red granite stone. Was he, so he was buried in the earth, which is very unusual for uh, Mendi people. And by Mendi, I'm talking about the entire language family, which is the Mende, the Madingo, the Loma. Is it, At that period in history, it was very strange for them to put a marker over a grave. It is a very Western thing. So Bold Swain was buried, and a lot of the, the, the Westernized people that were with him when he died in the, in the, in the late 18, I mean, 20s, they placed over his grave a granite stone that was still there in 1868. Yeah. Both Swain, Paramount Chief Zinna was supposed to have been the grandson of Both Swain. Paramount Chief Zinna, I think, passed away in the 1970s or something like that. So his grandfather would have been alive in the early 1900s, not the early 1800s. Mm -hmm. That's so many generations back. So there's so much evidence that these two people were not the same. No. Thank you. Let's look at our mm -hmm. caller here. And uh, the caller is Evans Morris. Evans, thank you for being so faithful to focus on my bro. You're always calling. How are you doing tonight? Uh, uh, well, uh, Mr. Johnny, welcome to my, my favorite platform, you know. And no matter how much people come in, it's our home. We love the program and we love to host. So we'll always be here whenever there's information that we need to learn. You know, especially about history and, and other things that would help us as well as a, as a people. Thank um, you. Quickly, I just want to tell this call. Thank you so much for the presentation again. Her, you know, her continuous commitment is really inspiring. You know, you won't see the 200 or 300 people doing this because it's educated and most people would rather, rather look at things that are sensationalized in the media. Yeah. We appreciate it. Those of us who are thirsty for knowledge, we appreciate it. Uh, quickly, mm -hmm. I just want to say a couple of things. Uh, when you just mentioned about some of us who may know some history you know, about all, you know, uh, groups of our own people, I think you may probably know this history as well since you're from Sino County. But uh, just quickly, this is from some of the things we heard from our grandparents and things like that, whether it's historically accurate or some some accuracy to it. But it's just about the, the, the separation between the Sapo people and the Crown people, you know. Mm -hmm. The legend goes that there was a guy because in the tribe, usually, you know, for for, for leadership or for rulership, the, 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 the two other brothers or the, you know, will have to fight, and then the, the strongest person become, you know, the head of the, the family or the head of the clan in that area. So, on this occasion, the guy who, you know, he refused to fight. He said, "I'm not going to fight. I don't want to fight because usually it was to fight to the death. You fight, you know, whoever wins the fight. Usually the other person who loses is probably killed." And then, you know, that's how, you know, leadership was taken. So he left, he took his people, he went down south, or let's say east, you know, southeastern way down to Sano County, and he settled there, and that's where you get the Sato people from. So they are really uh, crown people who left from Zanji uh, and went down to Sano County, and, you know, kind of invaded mm -hmm. and intermingled with the crown people down there. And that's how you got the Sato people down in Sano County. I don't know if you, if you heard that story or something similar to it, but just to kind of give a little piece of information right. you know, to the show tonight. Thank you. I, also, I just want no, to others, before you leave that, that, before you leave that, did they say what Sapo mean then? Yes, well, Sapo mean, okay, we're leaving all people that left or something? You know, you know, oh. It's in it 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 you know, Sapo, it means like a lot of people, plenty of people. Okay. You know, so some people think it's, a, it's, a, it's that where they work, the word you are from. Like, so plenty of people were in, okay. and we on that, on that, you know, on that side of the side of But, you know, it, it, it's now a, a point of contention that some of the double people say, you know, they like crying, you know, but they were traumatized because of the war. But, you know, uh, uh, pretending we be off their crime. But then, of course, they have, they have a lot of income, you know, uh, income yeah. marriage with the, 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 the great war and the crew, so their the culture has been kind of, you know, mm -hmm. you know uh, Based. But then to the to the Mandingo, you know, this is a question from his call. You know, we always hear the you know, some form of discrimination against Mandingo people in Liberia from other tribal groups. 
you know, but like she has kind of brought to light that has done a lot of contributions from the Mandingo groups in Liberia prior to even us getting our independence, you know, and the, 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 they have powerful rulers and powerful kingdoms, you know, even before our our, uh, our independence as a nation. So I think uh, my, my question, I guess, you know, I kind of just want to hear from her on this, on this topic. What, what would she say to us as, you know, people who are not of Mandingo lineage and how would she actually view the Mandingo people now, you know, knowing some of the things that we have learned on this channel and all some of the contributions that they've made. Because on another platform, you know, you always hear people picking on one guy because he, he's, he's a Mandingo from Sierra Leone, they always make fun of him. And it's, it's kind of cringeworthy when people do that, you know, because Mandingo people are are people who, who live on that west coast of Africa, they're probably the most dominant group in that area, you know, in terms of ethnic group. And also, lastly, before I go, I just want to say, um, uh, it just slipped my mind. I just, I'll just leave it there, but hopefully yeah. she can, she can uh, talk about that. Thank you again for taking my comments, John. Thank you. Come back when you remember. <laughs> okay. Any other callers? That was just one? Okay. Yeah, yeah. let's have one caller for now. Okay, so yeah, that's a great question. And, um, you know, I always like to, to point out there's 11 million people in West Africa that identify themselves as Mandingo, Manding people. Um, it's, a, it's a massive ethnic group. Um, and I, my, my understanding is they didn't become a massive ethnic group because they have more babies but through conquest and expansion. Most recently, the population of people who identify themselves as Madingo expanded tremendously under Samori Ture because Samori Ture, his strategy for liberation and fighting against colonialism and uh, the conquest of the Europeans was to create a Madingo state uh, where everyone spoke the language and everyone practiced Islam. So before Samori Ture, you Madingo and Muslim was not synonymous. You could be Madingo and not be Muslim. After Samori Ture, it was almost like a mandate because it was a battle cry. This was a liberation struggle that was both ethnic and religious. And so even if you were Pella or Loma or, or Bandi and you were uh, a subject, a servant, or as you know, to use the word loosely, a slave of the Madingo kings, you would be given your freedom if you converted to Islam and became Madingo. So you have so many layers, and this was not just in Northern Liberia, it was also as far as Ivory Coast and westward of Guinea. I mean, Samori Tours, the Sulu Empire was massive. And so the number of people who identify themselves as Madingo, some of them, a good number of them, would not have been Madingo in 1700. Their ancestors in 1700 might have been something else. So we talk about the fluidity of ethnicity. Ethnicity is fluid. Um, the people of the Kankan region are the uh, origins of the Madingo uh, language and ethnic group. It goes way back 900 years. I mean, you had uh, Sundiata Keita 900 years ago, you know, the conquering lion of Mali. You had all of these people. Sundiata was not Muslim. They had their own religion. Later on, Madingo kings adopted Islam. Islam started to spread by will. Later on with Samori, it became by force. And so that's why we have so many. Um, so the, the short way and the long way to answer your question is, uh, the presence of the language and the culture all the way to the coast is older than Liberia. Um, there were settlements and people came in waves, especially along the St. Paul River, through the corridor, through Balkuru, into Bomi, uh, also in Lofa. Um, after Samori Ture in the late 1800s, 1890s, um, you start to see the influx coming down through Nimba and Bong. And so a lot of the, uh, I won't call them refugees, but the remnants of the Wosu Empire when Samori Tui was conquered, um, then started to come south. So that was the last major wave of people that came was around uh, 1900. Um, and they, they set up in, in places like Banga, Ganta, 
And as time went on, um, uh, um, Seclipia and other places over the you know the years 1920s 1930s. So it is a it's a massive ethnic group. When the 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 people started migrating, it was mostly men. They marry women from the ethnic groups that they find. The children are a product of both, but it still continues to this day. So when I say ethnicity is fluid, I mean it. Um, you could have Madingo ancestry and be a Lama person. You could be Madingo, and, and many people are, and be have ancestry that's Pella or something else. Language and culture is fluid. It changes and can change from one generation to the next. So we are really one people. Um, and we need to understand that language, culture, religion are things that are not genetic. <laughs> it's something that people practice. It is culture and it can change from one generation to another. Right. Somebody just tell you. And uh, again, another King Sal Boso story, but we, we're not going to get into that now. We'll save that for later. <laughs> Say, did you believe in you know, King Sal Boso story being so serious? This one from Teddy Yankun. So the name Ya, talking about Yakuma, is associated with the original Hebrew name of God called Yah or Yahweh. This is why people's minds are reflected. Check uh, the King James Version, Psalm 684. And I, 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 I did this so that uh, we, we in uh, especially in Southeast, we were in, uh, coming to uh, the uh, down people, going to Crown and Gravel, we, we we can easily say, oh, we are from Israel or something like that. I don't know where this is coming from, but it keeps... It, it, it comes from the idea that, you know, people have gotten to a place where as we become Christianized and we, we start to adopt this religion, we try to find ourselves in this new belief system. Uh, homophones, uh, which means words that sound the same, Right. They don't necessarily have the same origin. I mean, yeah, there's only so many uh, sounds that the human mouth can make. Um, we're not Hebrews. No, we're not. Africans don't come from Hebrews. Hebrews come from Africans. We are some of the oldest people, the oldest cultures on the planet. We don't need to insert ourselves into Asiatic cultures for validation. We have in our own rights, our own traditions, given to the world much more than the world has given us. And it breaks my heart sometimes when I hear African people desperately try to connect themselves to cultures that are not even as ancient as theirs. Right. I mean, um, we, even the little history and from Bible, we see that Egypt, everybody came down to Egypt to learn something, right? So yeah. how can it be the other way around? And this is the verse he quoted, uh, that is Psalm 68.4, the uh, King James Version say, sing to God, sing praises to his name, extol him who rise on the clouds by his name, Yah, and rejoice before him. And the new King James Version even have my name in it, or something close. Yah, yeah. And, yeah. And, and linguistically, say, linguistically, J and, a, and a, um, J and Y are always, you know, portrayed similarly. I mean, these are, these, these are things that existed before the Roman um, alphabet was invented. So we're, we're talking about trying to, I mean, it, it just the timeline and the time frame and all of these things don't add up. It's sim similarly, when we talk about human migration and they will say, oh, the Basa people came from this place. Nobody migrated speaking the languages you know, you, you migrate speaking one thing and as you isolate language evolves. But a lot of people have in their minds that you're just created, that, that somehow these languages were created and that these languages don't change over time. The caller had talked about how Sapo broke away from crew, I mean, from, from Crump. Um, how long does that take? How long does that take for that language to change? Not very long at all. Not very long at all. And in um, even the Mendy speaking languages, at one point had the same origin. And as they separate and, and, and isolate, the words start to change and, and the people start to speak differently and become their own distinct branches of the language family. So languages evolve pretty quickly. Um, and so it, it's, it, it's so for when we say, oh, these people migrated from this place, or they say, oh, the Bible came from the, 
the this kingdom. No, there were people speaking by and some people came from the kingdom and intermarried with them and brought their culture and the language, you know, evolved from there. But it wasn't intact in the way that it is today. Um, these A lot of these languages that we speak in Liberia are endemic to Liberia. They exist nowhere else, have no remnants or relatives anywhere else, like like Gola. You know, for example, in Gisi, those places are unique to Liberia, Guinea, Sierra Leone. You don't find them in Mali. You don't find them in Senegal. You don't find anything similar to them in those places, uh, which means they've been isolated from the root for much longer. Yeah. Let's take our last caller here, and that's uh, Aliyu Samba Kamara. Aliyu, you live, sir. No, no, it's just that because you don't pay anything, so you talk too long. <laughs> you, you wanted us to go to Labro, you were going to donate them. Since we went to Labro, we don't, but anyway, go ahead. Where would you get to go to Labro? They get the most sent in Labro and Marble. Yeah, so we are on the radio. We are on the we are on the radio in Labro Monday, Wednesday, and and uh, and Saturday. And because of that, we are paying five hundred eighty dollars for per month. Per, per month. Ali, let's talk about what. You <laughs> <laughs> no, because see, one of the things that happened in Liberia that causing us to not move forward is the lack of self identification. Um, at one point in our lives, we're Europeans. We wear our pants, the front part backwards and the back part in the front. You know, we wear our shoes with the lace on those and drag it. But who, who are we? We don't we really don't know. And that's why it's important for, for some of the things that Colum is doing to, to go to Liberia. And I think this 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 kind of information will Africanize Liberians a little bit more. I like when she you know, let reference to the, con the connection between tribal people in Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone. For some weird reason, the tribes that are very much related from these very areas can discriminate against each other. Mm -hmm. There's tribal discrimination as well. And I think it's because they don't know these factors. But can we hear King Sound also and Boswain? They're, they're not exactly the same people. But they were connected. They were related based on the family side because King Sao Boso mother was from Bokolo and he was a descendant according to the gene. This is not a very ambiguous story. I have not done enough research. We want to hear the oral history that lives on for so long and then it tends to become true. But I know that, that Boswe and King Sao Boso uh, were not the same people, but they were related. I think he was the grandson of great grandson, something, something, mm. maybe not exactly from Boswell, but are related from the Pele side because King Sao Boswell's mother was also from the Boku area. I know, I know of it because King Sao Boswell uh, hail from my grandfather's town called Jambulo, where his father was the Kamara as well. So I come from that, from that, 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 that heritage. But I never see this to some of our people. I can hear our down people when they sit down to see, I hear friends say, I always see this thing. He said, the dumb people are Israel like they're Jewish. So let me tell my people today. <laughs> you're not Hebrew. You're, you're just black African. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for having me there. <laughs> I mean, you can enjoy I mean, the tribe, the tribe, of, the tribe of, of Dan, D A N, is uh, one of the tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel, the tribe of Dan. Mm -hmm. I've heard people, um, some of my Madingo people say that they are descendants of this group too. I mean, it's just religion um, is, is, is powerful. It's powerful and it influences how we filter and understand information. You don't have to be. Israeli or a descendant of Hebrews to be Christian. You don't have to be a descendant of Asiatic people to be Muslim. Um, culture is fluid. And even if there's no uh, ancient connection to it, uh, it, is, it is what it is. Um, as far as the oral tradition for Sao Bozo, um, that definitely um, makes sense what the caller said because it is consistent with what was written 
um, in the in the in the nineteen sixties when they, they interviewed people about Sal Bozo. Uh, both Swain did not come to Liberia with women, so he clearly would have had children with the women that he met. So he has absolutely has biological descendants in Liberia. He was Balam, but he had to. A lot of these conquerors, when they come in, these people, when they come in, um, even, you know, what they do is they, they they take women. They conquer a place. They take all the fine girls and they bring them back and they they they, they keep them in a harem and they have children with them because they're powerful. Yeah. And this is a, this is this is it's not it's not marriage. It's not exactly polygamy because polygamy is an institution of marriage. This is just an act of war. It is a it's an act of war. And it's something that happened in Africa, um, all over the world. I mean, Genghis Khan, they say, you know, 18 million people are descendants of Genghis Khan because he was a conqueror. You go in, you grab people, you rape them, you, you, you kill the men, you rape the women. So Sal Boso could very well be a descendant of Boatswain. King yeah. Momoru was a descendant of Boatswain, um, even though his mother, you know, was not, you know, Balam from Shabar. Boatswain had to marry people. So his descendants, Boatswain's descendants are all over Liberia. I mean, the, that St. Paul River corridor. I wouldn't be surprised if he has, you know, Pella descendants, Bai descendants, Bandi descendants, Mandingo descendants, because of, of the type of uh, person he was. He was a, a conqueror and they, they, they often uh, took women on the, when, they, when they conquered places. Uh, so yes, but Sao Boso, King Momuru, Sal and all of these other kings. Um, I'm going to focus on the ones that are well documented by uh, Anderson and others. Uh, on the next show, we're going to talk a lot about uh, uh, Masa, Masa Masakwe, the last king, the last great Viking. We're going to talk about um, uh, some of the kings of Bopuru um, and, and, and Lofa. Uh, so we're going to talk about them and then we're going to move our way eastward. So next episode we're going to be now we've, we've talked about the far western king i mean queen and we talked about uh, uh king gray and his father we're now going to talk about king masakwe we're going to go north of Bopu and talk about some of those kings um and then into uh lofa as well thank you and Next very, very continue to say the name of jesus is yeshua and god in our uh, crew is yeshua in crime is you saw so many very old person. So even if these things are similar, why don't why can we think that Israel or the Hebrew came out of Gribble? Why is that? <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. They, and, and this question we continue to get is why is our history not taught in school? Let's begin right here on focus on Liberia. And let's continue to uh, let's please uh, invite more people to watch the show and spread the good news that indeed. Uh, the Liberia History Channel is trying to make a dent in what has become, what has been the problem. Why is our true history not taught in school? History taught in school in Liberia today dated back to 1800. Was there no Liberia before then? Teach the children the true history. So this is an awareness and let all of us become ambassadors so we can uh, start learning about ourselves. Because if we don't know ourselves, if we can write, our own story and tell our own story well, somebody else is going to tell it for us. So until, as they say, until the, uh, the lion learns how to hunt, the story will always be told by the hunter. So somebody is telling our story, but we can tell our own story. Go, let, let's, let's, let me get your comment from the comments and then we can uh, wrap it up. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not a theologist, so I'm not going to, you know, touch on that any more than I already have. Um, I have my own my own faith and um, I wouldn't want someone, you know, challenging that. So I'm not going to touch on the, the issue of of, um, of that. But linguistics, um, there are words that sound the same that sometimes have the same root and sometimes don't. Um, what was the other question about history being taught in school? Yeah. It's important for it to be taught in school and it's important for it to be taught in school from the perspective of um, Liberian people. 
and not from the perspective of other people. And uh, I think that's one of the biggest tragedies of Liberia is that we didn't, the people who set up our curriculums didn't find it to be important to really tell the whole story and create a sense of identity and nationalism and pride and self-respect and patriotism and unity through the truth of our history. Our history is so beautiful, it's so powerful, we're so connected. And I saw one of the comments someone was asking, um, someone was asking if the story of Sal Boso was suppressed. Um, and what I will say is, I don't think Sal Boso was the most powerful, most important Madingo King. I think what happened is a lot of the stories of our influential rulers and leaders were suppressed. And the reason people even talk about Sal Boso is because when his name came up in the oral tradition, they tied him to Boatswain because no one really cared. <laughs> no one really cared enough to do the due diligence and, and see that it didn't make any sense. Yeah. And there was this overwhelming belief that these anglicized or westernized Africans on the coast that came from the coast were somehow those names were imposed on them by yeah. American Liberians, which isn't true. Like for example, calling King Peter Zolu Duma and saying Zolu Duma is King Peter from the 18, from 1800 when his grandfather and great grandfather and great great grandfather were also called Peter. In fact, the name Peter goes on the coast at Cape Maserato before the, the onset of the transatlantic slave trade. It's traced back, well, not before, but right at the beginning, before uh, the Grain Coast was even involved, really, before it became a massive, you know, uh, uh, a ripping of human beings. So we didn't know that or we didn't care to know it was just lazy curriculum building but later on what they try to do is they try to africanize these westernized africans to try to justify this false narrative that the first foreign contact that we had was with america liberians and acs it's absolutely false it makes no sense in the context of west african history that the first time we're going to be seeing you know white people was 1822 it makes absolutely no sense um, we had Dutch people at Cape Maserato in the 1600s. I mean, so 200 years before ACS ever came. And I'm saying this long-winded story to just tell everyone that it is important for us to go back and fix it. Tell the whole story. Tell the complete truth. It, get, it will give our young people, our children, a sense of pride and dignity. Uh, nobody is going to be a patriot of a country that they hate. And, and that, that's what I see happening. People go, oh, nothing big yet since 1822. Well, you know, we've got to understand, you know, how we got to where we are and that there were some beautiful stories that need to be told that are, that are, that are not. So that's my long-winded answer to the comment that was asking, do I think someone hit Sal Bozo? I think, you know, uh, people who wanted to destroy the idea of Liberia hid a lot of our heroes from us and made us believe we came from nothing. Um, and not only Sal Bozo and King Momolu Sal and all of these people, but also, you know, even some of our, our, our African American and recaptured African ancestors that were participating in creating the Republic. Thank you. Tomorrow at 1 p.m., we're going to have a show here called A New Day. And the presenter is Priscilla Yenanto. She's the uh, host. We're going to have a conversation on sexual and gender-based violence. The guest, Councillor John Gabriel, is the head of the Legal Team Foundation for Human Rights Defense. You don't want to miss the new day? It is a new day with Priscilla Yenanto. Presidential hopeful Tiawan Se Gonglo is coming to, is in America and here at Focus on Labro, we're going to conduct a press conference style uh, uh, interview. So I'm inviting talk show hosts from various platforms to join me right here next week to have a town hall meeting or a press conference style interview with Councillor C. Gonglo. That's the other one, C. Gonglo. You don't want to miss it. And it's happening here at Focus on Liberia. Well, Carl, thank you. Thank you, Dennis.
for coming again and uh, continuing to share knowledge. Uh, history is very important and we want all of us to uh, be a part of it. Uh, let me welcome Elder Joseph Kokoro joining us from uh, Trenton. He says, be it told by oneself or another, history will always be narrated from a bias perspective. Uh, bias is strong, but you <laughs> be narrated from the perspective of the person telling it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and Stella wants for us to burn all the books. <laughs> no, she doesn't. <laughs> she's just right? saying that she does it. <laughs> so let us not burn them, but we can learn from that. Again, thank you. I want to thank our viewers for watching. Until then, from me to you, we always end with the song that says, We are all like you. Whether you believe Kim, South Boso, and Chief Boso are the same people. You know, sometimes a lot. We are all Liberians. Uh, whether you are from Bopolu or you are from Kanwekan, we are all Liberians. What we can do now is how do we get our history taught so that we know and appreciate ourselves and appreciate the hard work the people that came before us did. Sometimes they even look at me and say, oh, you're the old people. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> Let's do everything so that we can all make our contribution towards yes. This glorious land of liberty. Good night and good night. Y'all, I'll be